Julia, it's wonderful to talk to you today. Are you are you at home today? You're in New Mexico? I'm at home atop a mountain in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Is it snowing there at the moment? It's not snowing today, but it has snowed and the mountain peaks are covered with white. Uh, and they s- stay bright white all day except at sunset when they reflect the colors of the setting sun. How magical. Because when I was reading your latest book, Seeking Wisdom, I've got here, you describe the snow and, and getting snowed in so beautifully. And I and whenever you were sat by the fire with your blanket around you, with your little dog that I've seen running around in the background, it, I felt like I was there. So I feel like I, I know the location very well and the tree outside your house. I loved that scene setting was was so gorgeous. And you know what I would love to do, Julia, is go to the Love Yourself Cafe with you. I'd love to do that. Well, the Love Yourself Cafe is out of business now. No. Due to the pandemic. Uh, and so they have a kitchen that's open uh, and they cook my food at the kitchen and deliver it, uh, which is a big blessing. Such a shame. So many great cafes have closed over the last two years. It's so sad, so sad. Because, of course, the the Love Yourself Cafe was um, a really important setting for you during the writing of Seeking Wisdom because you interviewed many of your friends for the book on the subject of communicating with a higher power or prayer. And I've been really wanting to learn about prayer more recently and I've just written a book that included a little bit on prayer and one of my friends Donna is very knowledgeable about non-religious prayer but for anyone out there that hasn't heard of non-religious prayer or is perhaps nervous to pray in their own life how how would one go about it what is non-religious prayer well I I think it's talking to God in a colloquial voice. I think that when we have religious prayers, they're frequently very formal. Our Father who art in heaven, or Hail Mary. Uh, And when we have non-religious prayers, we have prayers that are like, Hi God, how are you? Here I am. Uh, I'm having a good day, and thank you so much. So, you know, anyone can do that because it is just allowing yourself to speak freely and to ask questions, perhaps to send good wishes to other people. Throughout the book, and obviously in your other books, and I've, I've read quite a few of your books, you do use the word God, which some people might be uncomfortable with. Um, but you can use any terminology, I guess. You don't have to have a label for whoever or whatever you're communicating with. Yes, I say at the beginning of my books, don't let semantics be a bar for you. Yeah. I will use the word God because it's a useful shorthand Uh, But you might call it the universe, the spirit, the higher power. Uh, You may have a a different phrase for it, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that you try and contact it. Yeah, I, I totally get it. And it's something, again, that I've really needed to lean on out of necessity at times, having that conversation with something other than other humans, you know, something that's bigger, something that's grander, all encompassing. I, I love I love doing that. I love having that communication with life, essentially. And you you say in this latest book that you found proof uh, of a merciful God in a chain of events that helped you heal from a very tricky time in your life. But there will perhaps be people out there who who see God as judgmental or who see God as punishing, or they might even ask the question, how could there be a merciful God if terrible things are are happening on planet Earth? How can you start to gain trust in a merciful God if you really don't feel it? Well, I think it's a good thing to to take a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle, uh, and on the left-hand side of the line, list all of the negative traits that you were taught that God had. So you might find stern, authoritarian, punishing, 
punitive, jealous, vengeful, just a, a whole list of traits that we are often brought up to believe in God. And then on the right-hand side of the paper, next to the line, write the list of traits that you'd like a God to have. So then we become encouraging, playful, generous, supportive, loves to cha-cha. <laughs> and uh, you write down the positive traits and then I ask you to do an exercise which is a little bit challenging for people, I think. I say, take five minutes and write a note to the positive God. So they check in. They say, here is how I am. Here is where I am. Here is what I'm doing. Here is what I want help with. Uh, and it's sort of a laundry list of, I want to say, not complaints, but stating positions. Then I say, okay, now take five minutes and write a letter to yourself from your creativity God. So I want you to listen and write down a positive response. So what we do then is we, we write, hello, little one, how are you? My eye is on you. I understand that you want help with your screenplay. Well, we can help you with that. Uh, and so the letter from the Creativity God is positive. Uh, and I think that for many people, it, it's the beginning of what I might call a spiritual awakening. Uh, I don't think you need to use that term. You can just say waking up to a benevolent something. So is that a sometimes seeped in habit that we get into a habit of obviously thinking negatively, but also feeling a lack of support? And we just need to switch that on its head and believe that we do have support and there can be a benevolent higher power out there. Yes, I think we're trying to find an an affirmative sense of God, that we have perhaps had a negative sense of God. Uh, and then when we say, oh, I want to change that, that's the first step, uh, saying, I want to change that. Please teach me. If anybody listening to this has experimented with praying before, you know, I have probably more recently implemented relatively sort of disciplined approach to it in the fact that I really enjoy when I go to bed running through a little list of people I would like to send good wishes to and perhaps asking for a bit of help or guidance in things that I feel frustrated about. But if there are individuals out there listening now who have perhaps asked for something very specific and something very meaningful to them and it hasn't transpired and then they therefore might feel let down or even foolish to have prayed what would you say about again sort of well I guess looking at that how prayer works I'm, I know it's not as easy as you wish for something and it happens but I think people often do feel let down or disappointed if their prayers seemingly aren't answered. Well I I think we're talking now about something called Prayers of Petition, which is the, the opening section of the book. Uh, and we're asking God for a specific something. Please, God, help me with X. Uh, and um, when we ask for a specific something, we have three possible answers. Yes. <laughs> no. Not now. Uh, and I think that when we get a no or a not now, we need to sort of put ourselves back on our heels uh, and say, perhaps God has a wiser, bolder, better, bigger plan. Uh, and perhaps what I was asking for was somehow f flawed, uh, that I was 
too petty. And I think that what happens then when we remember that that God has a wiser view, we sort of bend our will to match the higher power. It's called surrendering. Yeah. Surrendering's often the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Because we're clinging on to wanting to control life, I guess, and we can't. So I guess, you know, surrendering is is the key to it and trusting in a good, you know, a bigger plan, uh, perhaps a better plan down the line. So you say in this book, and also I know you talk about this a lot in The Artist's Way, which I absolutely love The Artist Way. I've read it twice now and I do my morning pages. I'm, I'm not so good at doing the dates as I know many people find that more challenging, but I have found the book so so helpful and of course you know the artist way has helped millions of people unlock their creativity and do stuff that they want to do you know to get unblocked and to follow their hearts of creativity and you say that in seeking wisdom creativity is our route back to god or a higher power if there are people out there listening to this now that don't feel creative that just don't see themselves as creative beings, what would you say to them? Well, I would say to them, you are creative, you're just not in touch with it. So what I'd like you to do is try writing three longhand pages every morning, morning pages about absolutely anything, anything and everything that crosses your mind. And these are what we would call cloud thoughts in meditation. They just sort of come cruising in, and they don't have a logic because we jump topic to topic to topic. Uh, And what happens when people do morning pages is that they come in touch with a benevolent something. Uh, And again, this is where I would say, I'd call it a spiritual awakening, but you don't need to call it that. Uh, And what happens uh, is that they find themselves witnessed and guided and led. Uh, And what happens is that they begin to feel, oh, maybe I am a little bit creative. Uh, And they're gently coaxed into a view of themselves that's more positive. Yeah, I've I've found the morning pages a very interesting concept and I've always loved writing with a pen and just f- sort of free-flowing writing, but your your book The Artist's Way encouraged me so much because it's structured and you prescribe it as part of this creative course to write the three pages every single morning. And you do notice a lot about yourself. You know, sometimes it's lots of whinging and complaints and at other times it's more hopeful or there's gratitude in there. But it's it's really interesting self-inventory. Why do you think it works so well? Why does it help people unlock their creativity? Well, I think that when we move our hand across the page, we end up with a handmade life. There's a direct connection between our hand and our heart. And I think that when we start to write, we are gently led. I think that it's powerful and it's hopeful and people find themselves encouraged. And again, I want to say the word coaxed, gently coaxed forward. Yeah, I I certainly feel that. And I really appreciate as I'm, you know, well, just before I'm about to start making my kids breakfast, I really like giving myself that time just for me to see what comes out of the pen, to see what happens. It's a really it's a really lovely feeling. And the other part of the artist's way, famously, is the artist dates. As I said a moment ago, I haven't been as disciplined with that part of it. And it's kind of my personality. 
I guess, to uh, shun free time that doesn't have this, you know, end result because I can be a bit of a workaholic. And I think also perhaps within the structure of British culture, we go, oh, I haven't got time for fun or whatever it might be. We always think we've got to be working or achieving or doing something. Why are the artist dates so important? Well, I think, first of all, we should explain what they are. Yes. It's a once a week solo expedition to do something that enchants or interests you. In other words, it's a signed play. Uh, and I think it's very important. Uh, creativity experts will tell you that concentrate and then release is what's necessary. Uh, and so with morning pages, we're concentrating. And with artist dates, we're releasing. It's as if we have switched the dial over from send to receive. Uh, and we receive hunches, intuitions, guidance, uh, and you're cheating yourself if you're doing morning pages and you're not doing artist dates. So I want to yeah. encourage you to please try them. Uh, what I find happens is that people have a sense of a benevolent something. They feel a contact and they will say to me, Julia, I think I felt God. Uh, and they'll be quite amazed. And artist dates open a doorway to delight as we attempt to do something. We might go a sense at a time. Like I'm going to take an artist date around my sense of smell. So I go to a floral shop or a bakery. Uh, I'm going to take an artist date around my sense of taste. So I go to an Italian restaurant. I'm going to take an artist date around my sense of touch. So I go to a pet store and pet a beautiful bunny named George. Each one of these artist dates unlocks a sensory perception uh, and we become much more alive. So do they yeah. sound enticing to you yet? It does, totally. And I can't not do it now actual Julia Cameron has told me to do it. There's no way I'm getting out of it now. I have to do it. But it's um, it's so it's so interesting because I think many people, myself massively included, don't allow time for just joy or pleasure, um, especially solo. We're probably... I guess it's seen as the norm to go out in a group or do an activity as a group. I will certainly prioritise that with my family. But on my own, I often think I haven't got time for that or even probably one layer deeper. I don't deserve it. I think many people don't see joy and fun solo as a priority and, you know, I think culture influences that and all sorts of things. And I can see the magic there. So I, I promise you that I'm going to do it. I promise well, you. Well, that's a wonderful thing. If I can just entice you, that would be a good thing. I'm definitely going to do it. I'm definitely going to do it. Um, if you already have a creative endeavour, say you're a writer or a painter, I know you talk a lot about perfectionism and how that can block us. Can you talk to us about that? I'm very intrigued because I know that I've got perfectionist tendencies and it does get in my way with especially trying new things. So how is perfectionism hindering us in the world of creativity? Well, I think perfectionism is a stalling device. We find ourselves wanting to do something perfectly and we deny ourselves the right to attempt something. We deny ourselves the right to take what we might want to call a practice shot. And what I find with perfectionism is that it creates great sorrow. And I have a tool which I love, which is you take a blank sheet of paper, you number from one to 10, and then you say, if I didn't have to do it perfectly, I'd try. 
If I didn't have to do it perfectly, I'd try. Uh, and what you discover as you make the list is that your perfectionism is blocking you from a great deal of pleasure and joy. We find we measure ourselves against the masterworks of master artists. And we say, oh, I'm not good enough. And we don't realize that master artists began like us as amateurs, that the difference is that they kept moving despite their fear. Uh, so perfectionism is fear of exposure. We don't want to look foolish. Well, especially in this day and age, I would assume that um, perfectionism has got so much worse because we're all exposed to way more judgment than, say, 50 years ago because of the internet and how social media works and commentary and opinion is ubiquitous. So I think we are all capped by, yeah, that fear, that fear of being judged. But I guess when you look at it, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Someone makes a comment and you you have to pick yourself up and try again, I guess. Have you got any tips for that? If somebody's been through harsh critique with their creativity and is, yeah, still flawed, can't get themselves back to, to doing what they love? Well, I have a tool it seems to me like I always have a tool. <laughs> this tool is called Blasting Through Blocks. And what you do is you take a blank sheet of paper and you write, my angers about my creativity are. And you list all of your angers related to your project. And then you list all of your fears related to your project. So it's a list, it's an inventory a negative inventory of fear and anger. And then you call up what I call a believing mirror. Uh, and a believing mirror is somebody who reflects back to you your strength and your possibility, not somebody who says, oh, have you considered the odds? Somebody yeah. who, who believes in you and trusts you. And you read to your believing mirror your laundry list of blasting through blocks, uh, and then you're able to start. Yeah, you need a really good cheerleader on the side, you know, encouraging you when there's fear around, I guess. I've definitely found that helpful in creative endeavours to have good people around who are honest, but also really encouraging. So what about jealousy? I guess one of the other blocks is jealousy when we look around and compare ourselves fall into that compare and despair model, but feel really envious of what somebody else is doing. What is, what's jealousy telling us when it comes to creativity? Well, I think jealousy is a map. Uh, and it tells us what we really want, what we really care about, what we're afraid of. And if we write our jealousies down, we begin to see that they are a roadmap for our future. Uh, if I'm jealous about lady playwrights, it means maybe you better try to write a play. Uh, if I'm jealous about novelists, maybe it's time to try a novel. And when, when you look at your jealousy map, it tells you the direction you would like to go. So it's a very accurate, helpful thing. We don't usually think of jealousy as a good thing, but in fact, in, in a creative life, it's a very good thing. Yeah, sometimes we jump straight to shame, I think. We go, oh, I'm, I know I'm feeling jealous, and that's an ugly feeling. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be going there. I should be happy for everybody. But now... Like you're saying, if you can reframe it and see it as a pointer, you know, then it has some real worth when we're looking at creativity. So I know another exercise that you talk about in Seeking Wisdom that I found very fascinating was writing questions to yourself. You call yourself Little Julia. 
and you you write a question and then you let an answer flow. Can you tell me how you came upon that tool and and how it's helped you? Well, I call it asking for guidance. And I wrote in the artist's way, which is 30 years old now. Wow. I, I wrote, write your morning pages and then write LJ for little Julie or little Jeanette. Uh, can I hear guidance about X? And what I have found is that we can hear guidance. We are, in fact, well and carefully led that there is no error in our path that we are given what we need to move forward. Uh, And the guidance is often very straightforward and direct and gentle. And if we ask for help on an issue, we're usually given help on the issue and then maybe help on an issue that underlies the issue. It's my hope that people will start using the tool of guidance. I found that it was powerful for me. Uh, I came to write the prayer book because I did guidance. And I said, what should I write next? That was my question, my query. And I heard prayer. And I thought, oh, my God, no. I can't, <laughs> I can't write about prayer. I'm not spiritual enough to write about prayer. Uh, and the guidance came back. Prayer is a fine topic, you are a good writer, and you will have much to say. So I thought to myself, well, I don't want to seem to be lecturing people or speaking to them from a pedestal, so I better tell them how I came to pray. Uh, And that's why the, the book opens with my sobriety story. It tells you that I was, in fact, sort of cornered into prayer. So this was early on in your sobriety that it, it somebody suggested praying to you and you were at first not necessarily comfortable with the idea, but soon fell into a rhythm of f- hearing that guidance. Yes, that's right. I, when people said to me, uh, uh, you need to pray if you want to stay sober, I, th- I thought, oh my God, no. And then they said, well, you must believe in something. And I thought, oh, well, I believe in a line from Dylan Thomas, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower. I can believe in that creative energy and pray to that creative energy. So I started praying to that energy and saying, please let me be of service Um, Prior to that, I had always said, please let me be brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) It's a pretty good prayer. (laughs) And you ended up doing both, which is even better. Um, Have you ever had moments where that guidance hasn't been clear? I, I sometimes definitely feel that there's guidance in my life and I do a lot of writing, so I'll see the answers on the page at times or have clear thoughts. But when life gets really messy, sometimes I feel that there are so many thoughts in my head and there's been such a bombardment of exterior information that I've imbibed from my phone, the TV, other people. And that guidance just feels slightly more diluted. Have you had periods where it's been less forthcoming? Well, I have a tool, (laughs) as usual. It's a tool that in the artist's way I called reading deprivation, but now we have the internet, uh, and so I call it media deprivation. When you're feeling muddled, if you give yourself a fast from other input, most of us have a certain amount of reading that we do every day, a certain amount of cruising the internet. Yeah. And if we say... For one week, I'm not going to indulge. We find ourselves thrown back on our own thoughts Mm -hmm. uh, and our guidance becomes clear again. Yeah. I think most people would find it almost difficult to do even an hour of media deprivation, which really points to how 
you know, oversaturated our minds are, I guess. And there's more need for that more than ever for us to take time out. I'm, I'm saying this for myself more than anyone. I know that I need to have some deprivation from all of the outside noise because it just becomes, yeah, your brain gets very foggy and it's it's not ideal for creativity whatsoever. How does your guidance show up? Is it always pen to paper or is it just sometimes thoughts or are there visual signposts that, that give you guidance too? I want to say the answer is all of the above. Usually it comes to me pen to page uh, simply because that's what I make my devoted discipline in. But if I go for a walk, which is another tool of the artist's way, going for a walk uh, leads me to clarity. So walking, exercise, sitting quiet, listening to music, there are many ways to access guidance. Uh, And I don't think um, that most people do just one form. Uh, I, I think we find things that work and we think, aha, I'll try that again. And we do. But like you say, to get that clarity, we need the deprivation bit first so we can have a clear enough mind to welcome those signs and that guidance in. Because I can even look back on the last week and remember several moments where I've even said out loud, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do because I haven't given myself that space or allowed myself to have that that time and space to to gain that clarity so I think it's important rather than us trying to force signs to appear or like desperately clutching at small signs but to give ourselves that that time first is is imperative when it comes to listening I loved reading I've got a few of your books by my side I also loved reading The Listening Path which is a beautiful book it's gorgeous and as well as us listening for guidance and and listening for signs and listening to nature. Of course, we can gain a great deal from listening to other people. It's luckily quite a large part of my job. So I get to listen to people every day and learn from them. And I get so much from listening. Yet there will be people out there, of course, that will be saying things that aren't necessarily helpful or encouraging, especially when it comes to creativity, but also just generally in life. How do we know who to listen to and who to ignore? I think this is where morning pages come in again. At the risk of sounding like a fanatic, I want to <laughs> I want to say that pages help you to sort. They give you nuances. They give you hunches, they give you intuition, uh, and if you have an uncomfortable feeling about someone, uh, it shows up in the pages. And I think what we learn to do is to go where we have an expanded sense of self, to go where we feel good. Uh, And I think that when we have a nagging sense that something or someone isn't good for us, We're right. Yeah. We don't trust ourselves enough, do we, though? We don't trust ourselves and act on it. And we we ignore these feelings. That's why it's so lovely to have it on paper. Um, You were certainly one of the first people I saw writing about self-care. Obviously, everybody talks about self-care these days. But right back in the artist's way, you mentioned that term, self-care. And it's perhaps different for everybody and it's perhaps changed in texture and shape now we we live in such a fast-paced modern world but I wonder what self-care means to you I want to say it means tenderness that when we are looking for self-care we need to say what feels gentle to me what feels guided and careful and tender I think a lot of my tools are useful to people, not because they're a harsh discipline, but because they're coaxing forward. How do you know 
when to be gentle with yourself versus push yourself because sometimes stepping out of your comfort zone does require a bit of a push or for you to try something that doesn't feel gentle perhaps again i'm gonna say go to your pages ask your pages and ask for guidance so it's uh lf little fern and then you would say what should i do about x i feel pushed Uh, and you listen for guidance very often guidance will give you a shortcut a way to move towards something that you hadn't occurred to you Uh, and i think Uh, if you're taking, again, here we go, artist dates, you're, you're learning to listen to yourself and to spoil yourself a little. So I think what we're talking about is a form of pampering. And I think more of us need to know how to pamper ourselves than how to push ourselves. You're so right. You're so right. We're all sort of self-punishing to an extent and we don't give ourselves enough gentleness. We really don't. I want to um, ask you just about wisdom generally because, again, especially with just how the world works at the moment, it seems that wisdom, certainly in, I guess, the mainstream media, is somewhat sidelined for intellect. We put intellect on this pedestal and think that it's, everything and it's the driving force behind decision making and how the world works and wisdom I think feels underrated how do you feel about it well I agree with you Fern I want to say that we put the intellect above the heart and that the practices that I teach are practices of how to be more heartfelt more heart-centered and When we put our heart first, we begin to have a more tender, gentle, and yes, wise path through the world. When we put our intellect first, we're often sharp. I don't think sharp is what we're after. No, we certainly need some change with everything going on in the world at the moment. And I think wisdom is very much one of the things that's that's needed at the moment. And yeah, more more heartfelt communication. And I guess to be heartfelt and to follow your heart, you do have to rail against the norm to some extent because following intellect has become so normalised and a path that people feel safe and comfy taking where going with your heart perhaps feels slightly more risky. Yes, I think that's very true. I think that the tools that I teach are tools of tenderness, are tools of gentleness, are tools, again, of coaxing. So we begin by coaxing you into writing morning pages, and they, in turn, give you an, an enlightened sense of yourself. Yeah. More heart and less head. I think that's what we all need to aim for, for sure. Julia, it's been so lovely talking to you today. As a huge, huge fan of The Artist's Way and the other books of yours that I read, it's a total honour to to speak to you today. So thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure to talk to you.